Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, whether in which time zone you are here or in the Netherlands, um, great to see you all via Zoom. Um, an important day today, uh, International Women's Day, and I'm very proud to uh, give a few opening remarks. Um, I have two minutes. So if you have only two minutes, you have to come to the core message immediately. And that's what I'm going to do uh, right now. Um, the core message is actually simple, but not as easy to, uh, to implement. The core message is gender equality is an imperative, but we have not come far enough and we have not progressed far enough. That's the core. Now, let me give you just two examples to underline uh, that statement. First of all, and you've seen the, um, the poll as well, I don't know if the result was that the red line was the correct answer, uh, but if that was the case, it said 35% of women owning uh, small and medium-sized enterprises, but we'll come back to that later in the seminar, I'm sure. But another percentage that I'd just like to give you is that um, only 13% of Dutch companies doing business abroad are led by women, only 13%. And as an ambassador and as an embassy and as a consulate general, we often meet entrepreneurs. Uh, so 13% is by far not enough. A lot of untapped potential we have there, I would like to say. And the other figure that I would just like to mention is that gender equality at large Dutch companies uh, still needs a lot of work to do. Um, there is a report from Equileap. Uh, it's partly financed by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And it shows that there are more CEOs with the first name Peter, then there are women CEOs in the top 100 of Dutch companies. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with the first name Peter, but it shows that it's still a very male dominated business, also in the top 100 biggest companies in the Netherlands. Uh, and that should change as well, if I refer back to my, uh, my core message. Now, if there is something that we can do, we'll discuss it today, of course. Uh, and if there is something that we need, and many things need to be done, but we also need a role model. And that's why I would like to make the bridge now to the, uh, the person who gives the opening speech, the woman who gives this opening speech tomorrow. Uh, I'm very proud to uh, announce her. Uh, we cannot have a better a person uh, than uh, Mrs. Cruz. She has a resume that would make anyone proud, uh, but I said, I only have two minutes, so I'll keep it short. She has served as director of Salesforce since May 2016. Uh, she has been the former vice president of the European Commission, a European Commissioner for Competition and European Commission for the Commissioner for the Digital Agenda. And before joining the European Commission, she served in the Dutch House of Representatives as a state secretary and as a cabinet minister. Mevrouw Kroes, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I'm so thrilled to be invited for this event. And the best day for me, anyhow, would be when there is no opportunity and no reason anymore for uh, organizing such an event. But I still think, even in my optimistic mood, that um, that won't be during my life, so to say. For my dream is that men, as well as women, from all backgrounds and walks of life have the same opportunities. And the reality is that at the pace we are now, none of us at this call will actually witness this. That sounds depressing, but we could also see it as a motivation to accelerate change faster. For International Women's Day is a day, is a day of celebration. But I'm wondering, is there really that much to celebrate? The position of women is not looking that great. And I was impressed by uh, the quote of Angela Merkel, the Bundeskanzlerin of Germany. And she was just mentioning today, it's mainly women, again, who are mastering the balancing act between homeschooling, childcare, and their own jobs talking about the period of COVID. So all in all, women's rights are further limited in a lot of countries around the world. And COVID has had more impact on women than men. And women left the workforce in droves, domestic violence increased, and the pandemic will lead to a shocking increase in child marriages and teen pregnancies, to just name a few things. And I'm also an ambassador for flying doctors and what they are doing in Africa in just stopping the mutilation of 
very young uh, girls uh, is taking now a growth instead of going down. By the way, also when we look at the era that is fastest growing, and that is one of the lines that we should take into account during the seminar technology, women are still very much underrepresented. Investment in female founders plummeted from an already low percentage of 2.8%. Yes, only 2.8% of investments in startups and scale-ups went to female founders. And that is not on name, if they are uh, named Maria or Peter or whatever. Uh, the Peters are far ahead, so to say. And to make it look worse, in 2019, WeWork received more funding on its own than all female founders combined. And the year before, that's even more embarrassing, Jules, a cigarette company, received more funding than all female founders combined. Diverse teams receive a slightly higher percentage of funding, but still almost 90, 90% went to white men. And remember that these are the people that are building our future. A small homogeneous group is deciding what our futures like, look like. We should build the future with all of us to ensure a diverse and inclusive society with inclusive products and wide prosperity. And an important note I would like to make is that gender is not the only part of diversity we should look at. Racial inequality is a huge issue. And in all the issues women face, women of color are hit disproportionately hard. And when we are looking at the interview of uh, Meghan Markle and uh, Prince Harry, we are faced with reality, so to say. Is there nothing to celebrate? There are also things to celebrate. We had a lot of firsts for women this year. So let's be optimistic. You can see that being a negative sign because it should not be special that a woman is doing something for the first time. I see it as a sign of progress. Every woman being the first is a role model for others and will accelerate change because of that. Every woman breaking barriers for others is one less barrier we need to break. And all these first women combined will form the foundation for other women to stand on. I especially want to highlight a few firsts of this year. Did you know that the first COVID vaccine was invented by a woman, Kathleen Carico? Did you know the first time kid of the year is a young girl called Jitanjali Rao? What did she do? She invented a mobile device to test for lead in drinking water. And by the way, all well-known Camilla Harris became the first female vice president and first vice president of color in the US. And closer to home in my own country, also until this day, we didn't have a female prime minister, but we have more female party leaders than ever before. And another positive, while investments in female founders dropped last year in early deals, 30% of investments went to companies with a female founder or a founder of color. And where the venture capital world in general still is a white old boys club, so not too bad. The large majority of new venture capital firms was started by women. We also see more and more male allies. That, by the way, is important. This is not a women's issue. This is an issue for all of us. And we should all work together on solving it. The group of people that doesn't get it is getting smaller every day. And one day, hopefully soon, they will go extinct. Another positive sign is the implementation of quotas in more places. In early days, I was against quota. 
But when I was aware, looking at the figures, that uh, to get to uh, the goal that we have in mind, you need to have eternal life. And I don't believe in eternal life. I was just transforming myself. And I am now the biggest ambassador for quotas. For that will force people to look at the amazingly talented and capable women that are available and often not considered due to bias, network, pattern matching, stereotypes. Because make no mistake, women don't need help. Women are already amazing. They just need equal opportunities. The policies we develop should be aimed at making exactly that happen. People often ask me what needs to be done. There is no one silver bullet. There are thousands of smaller and big things that should happen. Certain things need to happen at the policy level, but that don't relieve you from the responsibility to take action. We can all do something within our own circle of influence. We don't need more research. We don't need more proof or facts that this is the right and wise thing to do. We need action. So my question to you is, what three things will you do this year to contribute to gender equality? Thank you so much, Ms. Ms. Cruz, thank you for this, uh, this wonderful, inspiring message and, and call to action. Thank you, uh, Ms. Cruz. Thank you, Ambassador Haspels, for your words and for being here with us today. I am Ruth Emmering, Consul General of the Netherlands in Miami. It's a great pleasure to be the moderator of this virtual roundtable on accelerating women's entrepreneurship. It's a topic I'm passionate about because half of the people on this planet are women. We're half the workforce, half the consumers, and therefore key to the economic well-being of countries around the globe. But yet, another simple fact is that the playing field for men and women is not level in terms of access to networks, to knowledge, and to capital. And currently, as both speakers have said, the, the, the impact of COVID is the women entrepreneurs that currently experience that, that are disproportionately suffering the consequences of the impact of COVID-19. So in the Netherlands is not immune to this reality. As Ambassador Hospitals mentioned, 35% of small to medium enterprises in the Netherlands are owned by women. However, only 13% of Dutch companies doing business outside of the Netherlands are led by women. And we see this in our daily work when supporting ambitious Dutch entrepreneurs that want to expand their business internationally. And women are greatly underrepresented, both at in-person events and in digital business events, in international fairs, trade missions, but not today. And for our government, diversity and inclusivity truly is a priority. And part of that commitment to diversity and inclusivity is supporting women entrepreneurs. It's supporting women entrepreneurs accessing foreign markets, increasing their international activity. We're reaching out to women entrepreneurs who don't always know how to find us or make use of our services. We're also profiling role models like the fantastic women in today's roundtable and Ms. Cruz that you just listened to. We initiate campaigns such as Business Beyond Borders to inform and to motivate women about international entrepreneurship. And in terms of legislation, our House of Representatives has passed a law to promote gender equality, to promote diversity on the boards of public companies. This bill contains two measures to promote diversity at the top of the business community. One third of boards must be composed of women and public companies must draw up 
appropriate and ambitious gender equality targets and report on them annually. So the Senate will vote next on that bill. But today, today we're going to talk about what is important for women entrepreneurs to succeed. How can we accelerate women entrepreneurship? We're going to hear from five amazing women entrepreneurs who will share their views and their experience, their personal experiences. So I would like to briefly introduce them to you. So members of the round table, and I would like to uh, ask you to, to put on your camera when I mention your name. So Natalia Martinez Kalinina is a community and innovation strategist who most recently led the expansion of the Cambridge Innovation Center to Miami. Welcome Natalia. And we have Jameen Moten, who is the founder and CEO of Skylar Security, an innovative leader in the industry of privately owned security companies. Thank you for being here, Jamin. And we have Janneke Nissan from the Netherlands, a serial entrepreneur, angel investor, board member, diversity advocate, and founding partner of Capital T. Welcome, Janneke. And Ellen van Rooyen, director of operations and research and development strategy at Monte Health. Nice to see you, Ellen. And then we have Miri Vermeer Andringa, Chair Emeritus of Vermeer, a global industrial and agricultural equipment company. I'm really excited to learn from all of you. So what works, what doesn't? What worked for you? And moreover, how can we potentially join forces to accelerate women's entrepreneurship? So Janneke, um, if I may kick it off with you, you're in the Netherlands. Have you seen, have you noticed any change in the Dutch tech ecosystem over the past couple of years? Also in terms of women's entrepreneurship, while you have built and successfully exited businesses in the Netherlands? Uh, yes, uh, definitely there has been a change. Um, uh, also in general towards uh, entrepreneurship. I know when I started my first company when I was 23, um, everybody told me you shouldn't do it. Why are you starting your own company? Being an entrepreneur wasn't cool at all uh, back then. So that, that's already a big change because today it's normal that you start your own company and people applaud you for starting one. Um, so that's a big change when it comes to uh, female entrepreneurship. Um, 10 years ago, I started Inspiring 50. That's a nonprofit to make female role models in tech uh, more visible. So that's not just around entrepreneurship, but to make people aware of the importance of diversity. And when we started that, we always had to explain why that was important. And um, that uh, conversation has shifted towards what should we do? And people accept the fact, well, most people accept the fact that it is important. There's still always some dinosaurs that uh, don't think it's important, that still question it. But most people, I think, do realize that there needs to be change. And um, so I see a big uh, uh, change in the conversation. When it comes to um, uh, investment in female founders in the Netherlands, the numbers in the Netherlands, unfortunately, are even worse than uh, international. And um, when you look at uh, VC firms and who works there, because bias plays a role in deciding who gets funding. So stereotypes, pattern matching, uh, network, uh, that all plays plays a big role. And, um, and that's a human thing. Um, so since the VC world is mainly white and male, that bias uh, is skewed towards one direction. So you see when uh, funds are more diverse, then they invest in more diverse uh, founders. And uh, in the Netherlands, um, that's not looking very diverse uh, and it's changing very uh, uh, slowly. But there is action. Fundright was released by the Dutch VC ecosystem, who basically put a quota on themselves to diversify and to uh, encourage uh, the uh, companies they invest in to diversify. So uh, that also really helped um, 
to uh, people to take action, um, but it's slow, it takes time. And, and that's why I also strongly believe that you get the biggest change by uh, funding new uh, uh, female GPs or diverse GPs from um, uh, VC funds. And um, because you, you just see that they invest in, in more diverse founders, that's quite a big change there. So um, yes, there's change, uh, but uh, it's too slow. And um, it's just so much missed opportunity um, for everybody, because uh, I, I hate it when uh, people say that uh, women are a niche. We are 50% of the population. Uh, people of color aren't a niche either. It's just an incredible opportunity to invest in these people. And um, I think we should talk about this issue until it's solved. And like Nelly said, it would be great if we won't need uh, a day like this. And um, I also want to highlight that it's not just gender, it's diversity in general that's really important. Um, because yes, these founders are building the future and we need to make sure that it's uh, an inclusive uh, future that we're building. I also want to applaud. I see Jamin applauding. Thank you very much, Janneke. Very, very true. Um, and and Jamin, going going to you. Um, does this sound familiar for from a U.S. perspective? Does it sound familiar having built a successful business in the U.S. without funding? So how did you start, and and was that by choice? Thanks again for for being here. Oh my, oh my pleasure. I, I mimic I mimic everything that she says. Um, I started a non non secure uh, non traditional private security company um, in Atlanta, Georgia, and I started it um, knowing the barriers that I would potentially face. So imagine knowing that we have not only an innovative security guard company but that I would have to build technology to make it all happen. Then we talk about scaling through Atlanta and then scaling nationally. And since attending the GES um, in 2019, now globally, seeing those opportunities right in our hand, we could do it. But trying to figure out how I would be able to build that. So there's a there's a part of our story that I have to I have to share. When I started the company, um, it is a non traditional private security company, right? So it's going to disrupt an industry. And as a women owned business, if I wasn't aware of those barriers, I would be fumbling over my feet right now. And let me let me explain that. So. I attended the WE, um, WE Atlanta, Women's Entrepreneurship Initiative based in Atlanta, which has an amazing relationship with the Netherlands. I pitched our technology solution and won a ticket to the GES in 2019. When I traveled to the GES in 2019, I realized that what I was building was going to disrupt the industry. If I didn't go to that conference, I wouldn't have been able to have that, that mental exposure to think that these things were possible. I then come back to Atlanta and I realized that my mindset was really focused a little bit too small, right? My, my, I should have been thinking bigger. I should, you know, I don't, you don't know technology until you go to the GES. When I went to the GES, I realized that I wasn't thinking big enough. But then there was a reality that hit me. Um, that how am I going to fund my business? How am I going to build a, a security company that's going to scale globally? How am I going to build this technology when I don't have a million dollars in the bank? I don't, I didn't have money to throw at a tech and then lose it because I was learning. I didn't have time to learn and pump, punch money into a technology solution. So what I did, I, and I realized that I had to bootstrap. And if anybody knows anything about bootstrapping, it is the hardest thing ever. Like I literally have hair on my chest from bootstrapping. Like it is, it is, it is, it is incredibly difficult. Um, and I've, in order to be lean, it's me. So I'm making these decisions inside of my business to make sure that I can survive a scale. And then we have numbers like this. As a police officer, I left my job. As a police officer, I had $100,000 in revenue and in 12 months went from $100,000 to a little over a million dollars in 12 
months. Like I have no idea how I'm even talking to you right now. It was so difficult, right? But I did all of it bootstrapping. Then we build the technology out, bootstrap that as well. So it's, we're, we're defying gravity on a few different levels. Um, but, but I mimic that because I'm literally building my business knowing that I have barriers in front of me, um, but, but not looking at those barriers. Like when I look in the mirror, I see an individual that people should invest in, not because I'm an African-American woman, not because I'm a woman owned business, not because, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm uh, for any other reason, um, but because I have a great idea. I have a great idea. I believe in it. And it is my job to in inspire others to see that same idea. But in the meantime, uh, we plan on knocking down those barriers by leveling the playing field because we have a good product. Oh, and then by the way, I'm a woman on business and that just puts a little carrot on top of it. Um, but I want people to see me for the technology that I'm building and the business that I'm that I'm building, and then it then say, oh, by the way, she's a woman-owned business. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. But I hope that we can lead the charge to make that the forefront. That women, it is it is good business. It is good business to do business with women. That's another wonderful quote. I wanna. <laughs> I want to applaud for Jameen, but yeah, and very true. And and it's really, really impressive what you have built uh, in in such a short time. It's amazing, and I look forward to hear more about it in uh, in a bit. Um, um, Ellen, I'd like to to move to you um, because you know both sides, Netherlands, U.S. Would you say there is a, a difference in in mindset between the Netherlands and the U.S. When it comes to entrepreneurship, when it comes to women's entrepreneurship in particular, also for women uh, entrepreneurs in the sciences like you are. Yeah, that, that is really a great question. Um, and I think from my personal experience, it has really been this difference in mindset that has empowered me to jump from academia to becoming a biotech entrepreneur and company builder. And so I have a slightly different background than the other panelists. I am a, a scientist by training and that inherently comes with a very, or it used to be a very narrow focus. You're doing fundamental science. And uh, when I did my PhD in the Netherlands, even if this was at a very prominent um, institute, the Hubrecht Institute, uh, led by people that are also serial entrepreneurs, there was a clear silo between entrepreneurship, taking your science to the next level and developing therapeutics and doing your science. And it was only until I moved to Boston, to the Boston ecosystem, uh, that I was exposed to this different mindset. And uh, this was really refreshing and inspirational. And so Boston um, is really a unique ecosystem. It brings together some critical elements that are hard to find anywhere else in the world. Um, for instance, there's a key uh, access to um, talent, not just from like top universities like Harvard, MIT and others, but also there's over 400 um, biotech and pharma companies. So there's a massive concentration of talent across the different industries. Uh, and there's also uh, access to, um, to a lot of capital, um, to top VC funds for different stages of company development that really allow you to work cross-functionally. And so what was striking to me was that these things don't live in silos. There's actually a lot of cross-pollination across uh, academia and industry, uh, collaborations, et cetera, but also a lot of the principal investigators at the university spin out companies and our entrepreneurs themselves. Uh, and that was like a really refreshing perspective uh, to see that that is possible and that you have the ability to bring your science to the patient, you know, and doing it and doing it yourself. And so for young entrepreneurs, there's also a lot of tools that help you on your journey. Uh, both from within academia um, and, and outside organizations, also for women. There's a lot of professional organizations that help you, you know, start a company, like what do you need, like educate you and create a network for you, which is very, uh, very unique um, and, and not as present in the Netherlands, I would say. Uh, but for me personally, when I came to Boston and I went to Harvard, on my first day of onboarding, there was an onboarding session with the technology transfer uh, office. 
which is, I mean, I had never been exposed to these kind of people before, but it was like, you know, we're here. If you have anything cool from your science, you know, come to us early, let's talk about it and let's see how we can like develop this further, uh, which is really, um, really quite cool. But I think the key difference, uh, the most important difference is that uh, here in the US and in Boston in particular, there's an acceptance for risk that is much higher than back home. And I think this really pushes things forward. Uh, so from my experience, and you know, I've been in the US for 11 years now, so I know things are changing for the good and it's really encouraging to see uh, the innovation efforts that the Netherlands has been rolling out. That's super, uh, super exciting. Um, but when I was there, I felt like the mentality of the Dutch was more conservative. Like, you know, do we really need another solution? Is it really necessary? A little bit like uh, what Janneke was uh, talking about. Like, is this, you know, worth the effort? Do we want to do it? But in the US, like if you have like uh, a good idea, a bold idea, a compelling story, an innovative idea, people are much more willing uh, to support that, get on board, get it going. Um, they're really tuned into the passion um, and, and to the potential uh, because they know with great risk uh, comes great reward and great impact. And so one of the um, extreme examples of this is uh, flagship pioneering, the company uh, who I've been working for and with since 2017. And this is like an, an example of a kind of unique innovative enterprise that conceives bold scientific ideas. And then without having done a single experiment invests uh, money and helps it um, you know, develop into a, um, a first in class life science company. And I think a most notable example of this uh, of a company that has spun out of, uh, of flagship is Moderna Therapeutics, um, who you've probably heard is one of the leading COVID-19 uh, vaccine developers that is helping to, to fight this global pandemic. And so that you know, has personally inspired me a lot to you know, help me um, in my own journey to develop as, a, as an entrepreneur and provide me the platform uh, to do this and to create um, a network, et cetera. So to uh, close the question, about mindset of women, I don't really think there is a difference in mindset that can be attributed to gender. I think women can be just as ambitious and driven and bold as men. Um, and yes, there are some elements here that will help women uh, develop themselves. But I think the other challenges come later where there are a lot of barriers that women face um, and uh, that, that leads to them being underrepresented in, uh, as entrepreneurs and in C-suite levels. Thanks, Ellen. It, uh, I see a lot of, uh, of very innovative Dutch entrepreneurs that are looking to the US. On the one hand, I think to uh, indeed make, make use of this, this very favorable business and innovation uh, climate. Same time hoping as well. And I, I know that there have also been some, some very positive changes in the Netherlands and maybe Yannick or someone can later um, share a little bit more about that, but thank you so much for your uh, your experience and and great that you found such a uh, such an environment that made you made you thrive in in all ways. Um, I'd like to to bring it even a bit more local for me in Miami to go to Natalia. Uh, Natalia, what has been the experience with with women and entrepreneurship in communities such as Miami? also noting the strong connection with Latin America. Well, thank you for having me. And it's been great to listen to my fellow panelists. So thank you all for your really incredible perspectives and experiences. So Miami, for those, I'm assuming many people on the call are less familiar with Miami or less familiar with the part of Miami that is not about a tourist experience. And so the important thing to consider for a city like Miami is that it's still very young. And so our entrepreneurial and business sector and innovation sector is even younger within the context of that. And so I kind of, I usually make the joke that where I refer to us as a teenager with a mustache, where we look a little bit more adult than we are, but we are in a lot of ways, this really adolescent city and ecosystem in progress. So the, the good part of that, at least from, a, oh, sorry, Sorry, I was getting a call. The good part of that from an innovation and entrepreneurship perspective has been that when I look around the impact space, the entrepreneurship space, the small business community, I see a lot of women leading, leading organizations, leading companies, 
um, leading cross kind of stakeholder engagement. We currently have a, our first female mayor elected for the county of Miami-Dade, and we have a GDP that rivals you know most Latin American countries. So you end up seeing a lot of women showing up in these gaps because there are a lot of spaces to be defined, and we're in a little bit of a Wild West youth moment. So that's really great to see women stepping up. I think this is in the context of the larger good news that we know that at least in the US, female entrepreneurship has been very steadily on the rise now for a handful of years. I think it grows about four to 5% a year annually, year over year. And so we know that there's kind of this general trend around the US, but the even better news around something like Miami-Dade County is that I think we're at about it's 30, I think it's it's late 30s. So it's something like 36 or 37% of Miami-Dade business owners are either black, Hispanic, or women, which I know these are very different topics in terms of race and gender, but it kind of, uh, it highlights this idea that we are a very immigrant powered and minority powered community. And so that is about double the average of what those numbers are in the US. So we are a very particular and very interesting microcosm for what you can kind of consider the future of the American city to look like ideally. And at least for women-owned businesses in Miami-Dade County, the comparison to the state and national averages is really astounding. We have, um, the last data that I saw, I think was from about 2012, so it's a little bit old and the current numbers are much higher, but between kind of the five years prior to 2007, so 2007 to 2012, I believe the rate of women-owned businesses in Miami-Dade County grew about 60%. The rest of the state of Florida grew about like 35, 37%. And so it's a pretty marked difference. Some of the complexities, and you mentioned Latin America, I think some of the complexities around this are, we're still dealing with a lot of particularities here. And one of the things that I see very much in Miami, and I believe you know other people will resonate this in their own communities, is that there's a lot of entrepreneurship and small business creation by women out of necessity, as opposed to opportunity, or kind of as opposed to delight. And this is partly, again, because we're an immigrant founded community, it's partly as a result of a variety of kind of social and human capital elements and challenges as well as just access to capital or on access to financing, but you end up seeing a lot of women starting businesses from a place of necessity. This is true the world over. I think the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor still reports to this day that women are, I think, one third more likely to start businesses out of necessity than men. And so this is definitely not a Miami specific trend, but it is something that I see a lot here. And it is absolutely the case in Latin America. So the interaction between Miami as a place, really as a nexus, I like to call us a, the Hong Kong or the Alexandria of the hemisphere, because we really are this point of nexus and interaction and tangible ideally tangible bridge building across the hemisphere, but we do get some of the kind of opportunity and interesting conversations happening in the US, but we do have a very heavy influence and a very heavy foot in Latin America. The result of that is if you look you know, at immigrant communities, we're an immigrant first community. I think more than the majority of, of residents of Miami-Dade County are foreign born. And what that means when you're starting on to, you know, a business out of necessity is that you have a very different risk profile. You have a very different access to funding in some cases. There are different challenges and roadblocks. Um, and so there are definitely, aside from things that we know and we've already talked about around explicit or implicit bias, there are real structural and infrastructure elements that make it a little bit more complicated. And then Miami sits at the intersection of because we're a young city, um, because we're kind of straddling these two different parts of the hemisphere, because we're growing very rapidly, but in some ways that growth can sometimes trip over itself. And so I think if I summarize where Miami is, I think it's a really, my experience here looking at female owned businesses and entrepreneurship has been really fantastic because I've seen it be a cornerstone of our business community and our impact community and i've seen it growing really dramatically but we also have to address and engage some of these larger either cultural or philosophical and in some cases structural realities that are not unique to miami but that we definitely see here represented at the intersection of the hemisphere thanks so much natalia addressing reality that's that's really something that uh yeah that we've heard before and we will here for a long time, I'm afraid, but that we will do with a lot of energy. Um, I'd like to, uh, Miri, entrepreneurship innovation, of course, doesn't only happen in the startup ecosystem. Corporates need to continuously evolve and improve. And, and for you as a second generation leader, uh, leadership in the business, but also as a quick side note, as a fifth generation Dutch America, how has your experience been with regards to innovation? Well, thank you very much. And it's an honor to be uh, also, I want to say, on this panel with, with my um, respectful uh, colleagues. 
And uh, yes, I am a proud Dutch American. My great grandfather came from the Netherlands to the state of Iowa in 1856. And one of the things I actually have appreciated about the Dutch heritage is that over the last couple of centuries, in many cases, Dutch women actually had more rights and more respect than many of their counterparts in other European countries. And my father, when he started our company um, over 70 years ago, in 1948, he started with one team member and one product. And today we're over 3,500 team members around the world and 220 different construction and uh, agricultural products and manufacturing in four states in the US, but also in the Netherlands and also in China. My father never put any barriers around me. He very much held that philosophy of respect for women and always said, if I wanted to be in the business, I could be involved in the business at, at really any level. And so um, I've been involved in the business for nearly 40 years. And one thing I've learned is that his entrepreneurial spirit has to continue in the second and third generation if we're going to continue not only just to survive, but to thrive in business. And so one of my dad's mantras, and I think it, 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 it fit for him as an entrepreneur, but continued to be important for us in second and third generation is always look for a better way. So for him, the better way was new products, taking um, work out of tough situations like he invented a stump grinder that grinds stumps out of the ground, or his iconic invention was the large round hay baler 50 years ago uh, to, to make it a one person system. But he was always looking for a better way. But in the last 20 plus years, um, I've really had the honor and opportunity to champion continuous improvement in our company or the Toyota production system. So taking waste out of every single process. And again, we have to keep reinventing ourselves and learning new things. Um, my father also was very, um, very big on finding the right people on your team, people who have the right character, competencies, and chemistry. And I really think for women entrepreneurs, wow, for you to start the business is awesome. But for you to grow the business, you've got to be able to have good people you can delegate to. And then um, just finally, um, I have been able to um, break some barriers in the past. And I was the first and only woman in 125 years to chair the National Association of Manufacturers, which is 14,000 manufacturing companies across the country. And in that and in working with, thank you, with a male dominated construction company, I have found that for me to be respected, I need to have really good communication skills. It means listening more than talking, always taking notes, always listening to the concerns and the issues, finding answers to those and making sure I close that loop of communication um, and give people feedback, whether it be one of my team members on the plant floor or a dealer or a customer or an associate in, in the, the NAM. So always looking for a better way, finding the right people, and strong communication skills, I think, are important for entrepreneurs at every level in a business. Thank you so much, Miri. I wanted to ask you about the, the manufacturers, so I'm very happy you already addressed that now. Um, uh, I have a few more questions, and I'd like to, of course, also give the audience the opportunity to ask questions. So I'll move to, to a second set of questions. So, um, Ellen, just getting back to you quickly. Um, how how do we accelerate women's entrepreneurship? Yeah, that's um, that's really what we should be talking about, right? Like, how do we like course correct, and what can we do now versus you know for the next generation? And I think like there have been a lot of initiatives that will make the you know the next generation of uh, young talented entrepreneurs their path a, a little bit easier. Um, but um, there's there's also things we need to consider now, and I think it really takes a multi layered uh, approach to accelerate women entrepreneurship uh, and change this dynamic and um, and change the unco uh, unconscious bias uh, that exists in, in many different levels. And so I, I really resonated what Nelly said in her um, introduction speech that we cannot do this alone as women. It's great that we need like some uh, women networks to help you know uh, hold up mirrors and help women accelerate and educate them. But we really need um, male champions as well to make this change. Like we're all human after all, we're all entrepreneurs. That should be the leading factor here. And I think like um, 
we need um, to create a way where also um, our, our male entrepreneurs feel comfortable in giving us a brutally honest feedback. And I think this is challenging for multiple reasons. Um, but for instance, like in the life science world where you know it works a little bit differently than just purely tech because uh, people uh, that fund the, the biotech businesses, the, the VCs who are also mainly male uh, dominated uh, as in, in other industries as well, um, they want to see experience. They're taking a high risk. So they want to hire people who have done it before, who have done, uh, created and led successful biotech businesses. And there's fewer females there. There's only like less than 10% of all female CEO, of all CEOs in biotech are females. And so I think um, what is also interesting is to really try to understand and work with people who make these decisions on like, what do they want to see in uh, as a profile in their um, future CEOs or C le the sweet level um, uh, women, like what is missing or why can they not give women the benefit of the doubt? What holds them back? And I think by having brutally honest conversations around this, we might be able to also um, as, as females adapt um, and, and make sure that, um, you know, it's not just based on our communication skills or how we present ourselves, um, or uh, put ourselves in a situation where we may be able to uh, get that exposure um, and, and move forward. So I think this is like really one of the key differences. And then for, for women themselves, I feel like we should be more bold sometimes um, to really um, you know, seek out mentorship, um, put ourselves in a situation where we ask for things. I know this is maybe more difficult for, for women sometimes than for men. Um, and um, uh, in order to help us help us develop. And um, I think we all need to be comfortable with being uncomfortable uh, in, our, in our journey. And um, um, yeah, I think for the, for the women now, I, as I mentioned before, there should not be this barrier <laughs> and we should like keep pushing forward. We should keep putting ourselves out there, even if it's uncomfortable uh, and, and set the right role model for, um, for our uh, younger future women um, entrepreneurs. We have great role models here on, on the panel. Exactly, this is so. amazing. <laughs> And I must say, like, uh, also, Nelly, like, when I was a little girl, I was definitely inspired by her being a, I don't know if I can say this, but a badass <laughs> woman, <laughs> like, <laughs> just, uh, yeah. Fantastic. And now you're all role model, you're a role model yourself, and that's why you're on this panel. So fantastic that you got inspired and that you inspire other women by sharing your experiences. Uh, and that goes for all of you. So Mary, you, you having served on the, on the B20, the private sector's channel into the G20, focusing on leadership uh, in small businesses, but also entrepreneurship to create a better business environment. So any learnings or suggestions that you'd like to share? Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, I had the opportunity to co-chair the Small Medium Sized Enterprise Task Force for the B20 for four years and the B20 is a group of um, business folks around the world who are dedicated to suggesting uh, solutions to help all of the world economy uh, go in the right direction to G20 leaders. And the themes we kept talking about and trying to make recommendations were around access to capital, talent, skills, markets, digital economy. Wow, more important than ever, right? After COVID. And also the, how important it is to simplify regulations and standards for small and medium-sized businesses. I mean, some of it's just overwhelming for small and medium-sized businesses. I have a colleague who has worked a lot with female entrepreneurs in particular, and she said that if there are two things that can make a huge difference for a woman entrepreneur to not only survive, but to thrive, it's to have access to capital and also access to networks. Uh, networks that can help you through the ups and downs. And some of those networks, some are, have already been mentioned, but NABO is one of them, the National Association of Women Business Owners. Um, also the in the United States, it's the SBA, but every country should have their own uh, agency to really work with um, helping entrepreneurs plan, launch, manage, grow their businesses. And a, a, a more recent group is the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses. 
And I know in Iowa, we've had five cohorts already in this, and usually 50 to 70% are women. Um, but it really has been shown on national data with this 10,000 small businesses that businesses that are involved in that, because it's a cohort it's learning group, uh, they have grown more in volume and in people uh, quite significantly than their counterparts. And so my last um, thought would be just to really encourage you each to everyone who's out there listening to find a mentor, a man or a woman mentor, but also to become a mentor. And you've probably heard this little phrase that I heard from one of my um, uh, mentors many, many years ago, that a bird doesn't sing because it has all the answers. A bird sings because it has a song. And each mentor that you go to has their own song, their own story, their, their how they made it through the challenges, but also you have a song and share that song with others. Fantastic. Thanks. Thank you, Miri. Thank you very much. Natalia, you've been part of, uh, of various innovation initiatives. You've founded a few as well in your experience and also as an organizational psychologist, technologist, what makes ecosystems thrive? What makes them inclusive, especially? Ah, so this is a topic I feel very deeply passionate about, as I'm sure everyone on this call does as well. Um, I could talk about this for many hours, so I'm just going to try to condense a few thoughts to keep it brief. So one thing that I've definitely noticed and that I feel very strongly about is that I do not ascribe um, in gender or any other uh, kind of categorization to a separate but equal kind of doctrine. I think it's really important to create communities where people find support and like-mindedness. And sometimes that is, it's important for that to be around lines of similarity. So I understand where there are resources where women come together and women support each other um, or any other kind of minority designation where there is a lot of strength in finding that community and finding people who are like you and can help and engage together. So I'm not in any way dismissing that. But I think we often stop short of thinking through that is not the end goal, right? So if we're thinking about female investment, for example, the goal is not to create separate places where women are coming together to invest in companies. The goal is to get more women to sit at the tables where investments are currently already being made by men. And so the idea around that is it's not that there should be there shouldn't be educational or other resources that are created or on lines of similarity, but rather that we have to think several steps ahead and create on ramps into the places where we eventually want to be. So I think of inclusion as understanding that the on-ramps may be very different and creating systems and collaborations that focus on building on-ramps that allow for that plurality, but ultimately with a similar goal. So we're all trying to get on the same highway. If we're, get, if we're having people on different roads in the same direction, that's still not really inclusion. Ideally, we're all on the same highway, even if the on-ramps to that highway look different by community or by line of difference or by line of inclusion. So that's one quick thought or not so quick thought. My other, along these lines, my other kind of element around um, ecosystem building is that we throw around certain words and we don't nuance them enough and we don't consider the inclusion element and what it actually looks like to land that in the real world. So the main example for me is really collaboration. We, you know, ad nauseum, you hear the word collaboration in any ecosystem building project, but the actual, you know, collaboration is hard and thinking through collaborating around different uh, priorities, different types of stakeholders, different areas of need. Um, it's not, it's a complicated process. And so I would really urge for anyone in the ecosystem building world to think through when you say collaboration, what are you actually willing to do? What are you actually proposing? And what does that really look like in the real world? Because that's where you're really going to be able to make an impact. Um, my last kind of thought is, and this is kind of, this is from my academic background. Um, I'm an organizational psychologist by training. And I think more often than not, our communities, as well as our organizations are lacking psychological safety. We focus on so many things, except for kind of what, what are the key elements of creating a culture that feels psychologically safe and understanding that that is going to look different for very different types of individuals. And ideally, if we want 
workplaces and communities that are really plural, we can't necessarily constantly be serving everyone's needs at the same time to the same extent, but rather we have to be creating an environment in which people feel enough safety and trust to voice their opinions, voice their concerns, participate, um, not participate, whatever the, the kind of eventual outcome is. And so I would, I think it's something that goes largely unsaid. And the, my last thought is that very often around kind of paradigms of diversity, there's kind of three broad paradigms of diversity that are generally accepted. And the first one is, um, you know, the most basic one in which an organization or a community is really just looking to hit its basic numbers. So if there's a quota or a marker or, you know, you you, everyone, you now need a woman on every board or you need X, Y, Z, you're trying to just hit whatever the basic legal or moral imperative is and you count and you count that as complete. Hopefully and thankfully, most organizations and communities are thinking a little bit beyond that. The second paradigm is better, but it's the place where most, most of us get stuck. It's the one where we realize diversity is really valuable, but we tether that diversity to a very specific um, way of presenting, right? So you hire someone who is a woman to do your woman focused work, but you don't hire a woman to do some other part of the business, right? Or you hire an Asian American to do your Asian American marketing, but you don't hire an Asian American person to do, I don't know, to run your finance department or whatever it is you're doing. So it's this tethering of diversity is really valuable, but I think of your diversity as being really relevant only in the things that relate to your diversity or to a certain degree limited around that. It feels good. It feels like we're moving forward, but it's actually the place where most of us get stuck. And the real paradigm that we want to be functioning in as ecosystems and as organizations and communities is the third one, where we value plurality very broadly and we actively think about how do we include plurality of thought, plurality of experience, uh, plurality of education, plurality of context. And those are really difficult systems to build because they are not one, fight, one size fits all. The on-ramps have to be different for people. And it's really important for folks to feel like they can raise their hand. And that takes different activations and different points of inclusion. So those are kind of my thoughts. Thanks, Natalia. One of the things you said is how willing people are to make an impact. And I think that's a very nice uh, bridge to Janneke because Janneke, you, um, uh, especially in the world of, of, well, the Dutch tech ecosystem, but also venture capital funding, how do you see venture capital funding play a role in this here in the US, in the Netherlands to make this ecosystem more inclusive? And how do you see your role and the role of other successful entrepreneurs? Yeah, I think um, venture capital plays a huge role. If you look at the large comp the, the largest companies today, eight of the 10 started by VC funding. So VCs really decide what our future looks like. And um, well, as mentioned before, uh, it's still a, a white male uh, group. So, and they invest in people that they know and look like them. But it's also difficult to diversify because even uh, we, when we started our fund, uh, I, I'm a successful serial entrepreneur, uh, Eva, uh, my business partner, she has a PhD in economics and worked as an investor, so we have quite a nice uh, track record. Um, and uh, still, uh, the comment we received more than once when we talked to uh, investors is you really need a man. And uh, nobody ever told us what that man had to do. So apparently just the appearance of a man would have been enough to get their funding. And uh, even uh, recently somebody said, yeah, I really can't invest because I'm a real man. And then you're like, okay, what's going next? And um, yeah, men like numbers and women don't. So in, in Oak, even if you do have the experience, um, we don't look like what a lot of people with money think that a VC should look like. So we are also faced with these uh, with these biases. And I think on the LP side, so that's the people that invest in uh, funds. What what they well, what I hope they start to consider is that um, by investing more in emerging fund managers, so people with diverse backgrounds who are like adding to the current uh, ecosystem that uh, those people will invest in more diverse uh, founders. So by investing in them, you can actually really have a big impact in what the uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem uh, looks like. 
So uh, I think uh, VCs can play a role, but VCs have to change. And uh, I think in the end, money talks. So the people that fund those VCs should speak up and demand more diversity because what, what really uh, doesn't work in my head is that network plays a huge role. So you always need a warm, almost always need a warm introduction to be able to pitch to a VC as an entrepreneur. And um, in an industry like the tech industry that's so data-driven, people that decide on the money just assume that all the big unicorns are in their network, something statistically impossible. It just, I, I just, I just don't see how they think that. And there's so many amazing uh, entrepreneurs out there uh, that don't get the opportunity today to grow because um, uh, one of the things, and I, I think Jameen mentioned that as well, uh, you need to bootstrap, but also in the beginning, you need to do a friends and family round. But what if your friends and family don't have money? Then um, this, this is really a, a play for people that are already rich and not per se all uh, millionaires, but the fact that you can live without an income for a year or the fact that you can uh, get money from friends and family um, is actually me, uh, defining you as, as rich. So a lot of people don't have that opportunity. And I think we should really focus on making sure that all the great entrepreneurs out there get the opportunity to grow regardless whether they are rich. We also had people telling us like, oh, the first 20 million, just race with your friends and family. And I'm like, okay, what friends do you have? Can I meet them? <laughs> but um, so I think there's, there's a lot of elements to that. And I do think that VCs can play a big role in changing the uh, ecosystem and making it more diverse and inclusive, but only if they change themselves. Yes. Jameen, I'm sure you want to add to that. And so also, good. if you can add to that, but also, you know, since this is a, an, an international roundtable, I'm also very much uh, very curious to hear a little bit more about your Go Global story since you participated, uh, you joined the Global Entrepreneurship Summit, but feel free to also add to what Janneke just said. Yeah, well, well I'll, I will do that. That was, that was, oh, that hit me, that hit me in my chest because, uh, you know, the, the entrepreneurs, like me who I don't have a million dollars in the bank. I said that I do not drive a Maserati. Okay. A Jaguar, a Mercedes Benz car. I am a multi-million dollar business that is bootstrapping, right? Which means all of the money that I'm making has to go into my business. So there's an incredible level of sacrifice. I put it on my LinkedIn profile one time, a picture of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, because that's what I ate the first year when we were scaling. It is incredible, not only is it incredibly difficult, it is possible to do, but there's a lot of sacrifices in there, right? And so all of these things and to all of the entrepreneurs that are listening in, uh, whether you're, you're in another um, country or you're in the US or you're in the Netherlands, anywhere in the world, there's just these things that these women are saying are incredibly important to do, to think, to be bold, to be prepared. So when the opportunity comes to you, you have to be prepared. So we always talk about network. We always talk about access to these opportunities. But to these entrepreneurs, when the opportunities come to you, are you doing the work to prepare yourself to, to take advantage of those opportunities? And then the access to capital. What do you do when the banks say no? Do you just crumble and fall or do you figure out a way to make it happen? And so, you know, my, that, that's, that, those are my, those are my, um, my ads to um, the, uh, the panelists comments because it, it's just important for entrepreneurs to understand what it's going to take to get from A to B and then B to C and then C to D. It is an incredible journey that you have to be resilient, right? I say the entrepreneurship is the journey of self. I say it all the time. You have to be bold. You have to be, you know, tenacious. You have to be courageous and focused. I didn't say anything about money yet, right? All of these things, these characteristics 
are going to help you get to the cash flow and the gross profit margins and the net. But if you do not have the tenacity, the boldness, the, the focus to be prepared so that when you get that opportunity, you can leverage it, then you're going to have some issues. But if you are bold, if you are focused, if you have the right network and you happen to have amazing entrepreneurs around you, the Goldman Sachs 10,000 small businesses, Mary, I, when I got out of uh, We Atlanta, Women's Entrepreneurship Initiative based in Atlanta, I was a part of the 10,000 small businesses um, two years ago. And it was an incredible opportunity to see women uh, the really short story. There was a lady on the panel and she said, my net worth is 1 billion. I looked to the left and I said, did she say B, M or B? I think I missed what she said. Is it an M or is it a B? And, and I had, the, I said, can we just clarify? She said, no, I said B. My net worth is over a billion. And she was in front of me. Seeing those images and hearing those stories, I left from Goldman Sachs um, ready to take over the world. But the other story, the Go Global story was when I attended the uh, Global Entrepreneurship Summit, right? I thought I was innovative. I thought that I had what it took to, to, some, to scale my business, to grow my business. I thought I was innovative until I attended the Global Entrepreneurship Summit. And not only innovative in the, in the concept and the system of the business, but also in my way of thinking. I, I thought I was out the box. I thought I was, was thinking what it, I thought I had the context to grow the business globally until I went to that conference. I realized I had a lot of work that needed to be done, not only between my two ears, but also with how I thought about my teams, our exit strategy, what it was going to take to fund the business, how it was going to get funding. So, um, you know, I pitched at We Atlanta and with the great support from the Consulate General's office in Atlanta, Kosha and R, two very, very, very amazing people, um, gave us the access to, with the city of Atlanta, gave us access to attend that conference. When I got on that plane and I went over there, not only did I, did I meet with so many global leaders, um, I, I, I fell in love with the Netherlands and will be forever in love with the Netherlands since that trip. But I realized that I needed to think about innovation differently. So I am an advocate of if you haven't attended G, the GES and you are an entrepreneur and you're on this on this this panel this this event here, you have to go overseas. Like you have to go to another area, get out of what is comfortable, get out, get away from, go around people that you have to lean in and get to know them a little bit to understand what they're saying. Get out from what is what is your comfort zone and and watch what happens to you but also watch what happens to your business. I came back with the resilience and a tenacity that I attribute to that experience. And so now Skylar is having conversations about our technology, not only for the private sector in Atlanta, but now we're talking nationally, now we're talking globally. That's a different conversation. And so as entrepreneurs, you have to put yourself in those spaces. That way you can allow yourself to just experience it comfort zones, get out of them, you, right? Disrupt your own self before you can disrupt your, your, your environment. Push your thoughts and how you think into different spaces so that you can have access to more, right? When I came back to Atlanta, wow, I was, I was, I was say, I was, my face changed. <laughs> I didn't look the same. I didn't feel the same. And I was, I was, I have a lot of gratitude for that trip. The Global Entrepreneurship Summit literally changed, changed my entire mindset, not only of myself, but also on my business. Uh, thank you so much, Jameen. And uh, that sounds like a great experience. And I'm so happy you look at it that way. And uh, fantastic. Um, there's one, one, yeah, not so fun thing to share. And that is that we're running out of time. So... I have to move towards uh, wrapping up. And I want to say to everyone who already asked a question in the Q&A, we will process all those questions immediately after the event. And I'm sure our speakers will be willing to also answer them together with us because they are addressed not to me, not to the team that organized it, but to the speakers. So we will answer your questions. So, um, for now, I really want to, want to say thank you, especially 
thank you for 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 thank you to the speakers thank you for sharing your experiences your stories um i'm really sad to to end and to wrap up now because i could have continued this discussion all day and there is definitely a lot that we still need to discuss because it's an, a conversation that's extremely important beyond today so we haven't stopped talking yet but i'm very honored to uh, to have had you on the panel to have you on the panel um, as, as mentioned in the beginning uh, of, this, of this event, the Netherlands government is addressing uh, gender imbalance with initiatives such as Business Beyond Borders. But also we, the Dutch Diplomatic Mission Network here in the US, uh, and, and Jamin already mentioned uh, our colleagues in, in Atlanta, you will see uh, on the map in a while, you will see all our offices. The, diplomatic, the Dutch Diplomatic Mission Network in the US is here to support women entrepreneurs. We will continue to pursue opportunities for women entrepreneurs by opening up networks, connecting you, and by conversations like the one we've had today. So we encourage you, even if it's not in a Q&A live session like we originally planned, but it was way too interesting what the speakers had to say to, to cut that short. We encourage you to reach out to us with your questions and with any suggestions that you may have. So in closing, um, again, you see the offices that we have here on the map. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. In closing, when you leave the session today, there will be a survey link that will pop up. It's only three questions. It will take about 60 seconds. But this will help us tremendously in ensuring that future events will be addressing your topics of interest, the topics of your interest, and in making sure that we can be most useful to you. So I would like to really thank all the participants, but again, uh, especially our wonderful speakers. It was a great honor to moderate this discussion. And Andre, Nelly, thank you for a great opening. And Ellen, Jamin, Janneke, Miri and Natalia, I really look forward to seeing the amazing things you will do next. So thank you so much for your time and everyone, I really hope you enjoyed attending and listening to our speakers as much as I did. International Women's Day, not only March 8th, but every day. Thank you. Bye.